I'd be remiss to not go back to uh, the exhibit and talk a little bit about Get Back. A quick backstory for me, uh, Glenn, is I didn't get into the Beatles or the Stones until I was in my mid-20s, and I got these records on vinyl. I wasn't, the, the, these, these just weren't bands that were played in my uh, house. Zeppelin was. I get it. I get it. And yeah. then, but, you know, going back and ingratiating myself with these as an adult, really, um, was kind of a rad experience because I thought of music differently at that point, you know. Um, and listening to these records in what I called my speakeasy, where I'd have cigars and scotch and play the vinyl of these records. And I loved doing this through my 20s. And one of the records that I gravitated towards, not knowing who you were or anything at the time, was Let It Be. Now, of course, I was yeah. listening to the version that you've described as puke um, with, that, with those mixes. But um, now that I've gone back and listened to it and knowing that the working title was Get Back, everyone famously will know now because of Disney Plus, all that footage that Peter Jackson went back to. I mean, I, that was Let It Be was a great record to me because not because the sonic mixes or anything, but the writing of it was so different. And now that we've been able to see the documentary that I didn't really know about, I just... I really gravitated towards it because that, that was an experimental record. They were doing a live record in a weird sound stage. Like, it was a very unorthodox thing for the time. And then, of course, you and Ringo famously talking about, hey, let's throw it up on the roof for the live setting. And then it becomes this iconic thing for the band for so many years. So, so much that, that there's an exhibit about it. There's a fucking documentary about it. And your, your, your finger's in all of it. You know, like, can you take me, like... I know that you've probably had so many of these questions about this because it's the thing that everyone's talking about right now. But can you bring me into your perspective of being a part of Get Back or Let It Be? Um, okay. Having, having worked with the stands for so long, um, right up through this 1969 when I got the call, well, I got the call in December 1968 from Paul McCartney, to ask me to go along and, and do the get back thing. It was based on the fact that he wanted to make a live album of all new material, which no one has ever done. Even to, to this day, no one's ever done. God, so, so, ambitious, mean, so ambitious. So ambitious. Well, I mean, well, only they could pull it off. Maybe the right. Stones could, but certainly the Beatles. I mean, with the quality, I mean, the, the interest in them. But don't forget in 1969, they were the biggest act in the world by times a hundred. I mean, right. just they couldn't go anywhere on the planet without somebody knowing who they were and recognizing and all that. So it was pretty huge. So the fact that he was calling me was uh, was a shock because they, as you know, they've been working, or perhaps you don't, they'd been working with George Martin as their producer and the guy called Jeff Emmerich was their engineer at Abbey Road forever and, and other other engineers than Jeff, but Jeff was the, was the main guy. And they proved they'd rewritten the rule book as far as produced records were concerned with Sgt. Pepper. Uh, and this was sort of the complete, going back to the beginning, the four of them sitting around playing and singing. It's so cool. So cool. It, it's unbelievably cool. And so I, obviously, I jumped it. I mean, I wasn't going to say no. Um, <laughs> right. Um, I had no idea that George Martin wasn't going to be producing it, which. I found out as we went along. Um, although he did, he did come along on some days and sort of hovered about keeping a BDR on proceedings. Um, the main thing was I'd never worked with them before. I knew Paul. I'd met Paul previously, and I'd met John and Paul together. Uh, they came in and sang back up on a Stones single uh, that I did. So I, you know, I, I'd met them. Um, but I didn't really, I didn't really quite know what I was letting myself in for. So I walk into the first day at, on the sound stage at Twickenham, um, a little bit apprehensive. But within minutes, they all made me feel so welcome. It was very cool. And, and by the end of the day, it was like we'd been working together for years. And they, they were really cool. They were very cool. And it was an odd time for the four of them. They had seen each other for 18 months. The, the last album they'd made was 18 months previously. Um, Yoko was introduced to the band on, on the first day um, and was, was a presence, uh, which was a little odd for everyone, I think. Um, it was, it, and, and actually the other three weren't that kick. It was Paul's idea. The other three were 
going along and turning up to support Paul, but they weren't absolutely convinced in, of the idea. They thought it might be a bit odd. And that became apparent as the days went by, they decided uh, they didn't really want to do it, you know, the way Paul did. So that was, it, that was interesting. Oh, yeah, <laughs> was, to say the least. You know, a, well, I never quite knew where, where we were. And yeah. frankly, if, if, if there hadn't been a documentary being made about the making of the TV show, which is what the live concert was going to be. Yeah, it was, yeah. I don't know what would have happened, but since we, we were, every day was being filmed, we got to the point where we needed an end to the film, never mind about the, the concert, whether it happened or not. Uh, and also we, were, we needed to make an album, which is the film uh, displays really well, I think. Yeah, so you, so you, you've obviously watched the documentary. Have you watched all three parts? And <laughs> yeah. You all cut? Okay. How? That's another question in itself. And I, how? How does that feel to look back at that so many years later and see Peter Jackson's interpretation rather of what's going on? And and I mean, he's using those mixes in the room. So those weren't your mixes. Those weren't even the other guys' mixes of some of these songs. They they obviously had to. Bring in their own mixing, right, f to create this documentary. Okay, the, the all the stuff at, uh, at Twickenham on the sound stage mm -hmm. was recorded in mono on a Nagra with a boom mic, so that's all there was. Wow. Um, yeah, and then when we moved into Savile Row, I had an eight-track machine, and that's all my stuff. I did record some stuff at Twickenham, but the tapes got lost. Wow, that's that's a travesty. No, no, one, no one knows where they are. Wow. So, well. I will say, going back now and listening to the mix, and having seen the the documentary, the mix that you did, th you could definitely see why that was the 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 goal. Like your mix makes more sense for what the goal originally was. Like it just it just does. Because yeah, when, you, when I when I referred to, to a load of puke, I was I was referring to Phil Spector's version and what he did. I think he puked all over it. Basically, he, he, polished, he polished it up and turned it into a recorded album, not yeah, a live but, album. Yeah, and it's, and it's nothing to do with what we were about at all. Mm -hmm. And, um, hey, enough said. Yeah. So, I mean, I got, I, I had become very convinced that uh, while we were doing the record, while, while we were working on the material, that what ended up as my version was going to be the only way it was ever going to be an album, to be honest with you. And I wanted to show, like the film does, I wanted it to be a fly on the wall and have the full starts and them taking the mickey out of each other and all that. Because I was witnessing that and I'm thinking, God, you know, I'm sitting in here watching this going on. Wouldn't it be great if everyone else could see what this is? Because you actually get the interaction between the four guys. Because um, you, you never see that. You, you see them all yeah. interviewed as a force. Never seen that. That's why it's the coolest uh, fucking thing in the world. I'm yeah, so glad exactly. they finally released it, and everyone can yeah. get. I mean, your your version was like the first bootleg of any record that like went like everyone wanted to hear. Like that's that's incredible. Like, and listening back to it, being in a band now, uh, that dynamic between musicians and friends who are in a room just working together. You've seen it a million times. I've been a part of it, a, maybe not a million, but a, a few less times, but still been a part of it. No one else, going back to this normal life of like Charlie, like, like for you, like what a, what a normal life would be growing up, you don't realize it until later when you're being uh, introspective or retrospective of it, that right. that's not normal for other people to experience. So like, like when they're watching this, they're like, oh my God, this band is insane. What the hell were they trying to do? And I'm sitting there going like, this is interesting. This is exactly what we all do when we get yeah. together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've, yeah. Been doing, I've been doing that with the Stones for years. I mean, Mick and yeah. Keith wrote in the studio all the time. The Small Faces wrote in the studio. Everybody did, you know. They, everybody wrote. That, that process was quite normal. And actually, I think it's a great way to record. If you write in the studio, you can... You can put it down and listen to it and see how bad it is. And, you know, you, you can use the recording as a tool to help you develop the material. Right. No, that's that's a brilliant point right there. Listening back and like uh, going back and messing with the parts and stuff like that's something we do yeah. now in Pro Tools pretty easily. But back then, I mean, you're filming it and you're like, all right, come back in here because this part was really good. Like, what do you guys think about expanding upon this? You know, that's that's a great way of, of writing, especially for the day. Um man such a cool fucking piece of history music history as i said i gravitated before 
and I didn't even get the personality of the album. And I had the Phil Spector version until recently. And now it's like, you caught everyone's personality without even seeing the documentary. Like you can yeah. hear, you hear the falsetto joking around. Like that's how, yeah. that's how we, that's how we do sound checks and stuff for yeah. years. Like we, we've always messed around with our own songs. Like you play them so often you get bored. So you're like fucking doing all that. And like yeah. you hear Lennon messing around, you hear, you hear Paul, the lyrics themselves are like, they're so tongue in cheek. And I, I think it went over everybody's head at the time when it was released as a regular record. But like now you listen back to those lyrics you're like, oh, he, yeah, he's talking about some shit right there. 